everybody, welcome back to my channel. It has been a while since I've just sat and answered some of your questions. And so we're doing a good old fashioned Q and A today. I'm not even gonna tease you any further. Let's just get into the questions. Do you still plan on moving house? Do you have any other plans for changes to the flat? This question came up a lot. I made a whole video at the end of last year about how we were moving house, we were upsizing, we we're gonna be buying a new house, we we're gonna be selling our flat. And then suddenly I made this video about how we were like doing up the spare room to be Rowan's bedroom. And then everyone's getting very confused about like, wait, what's going on? I thought you were moving. Let's clear some things up. So no, we are not moving house anymore. We are very much staying in the flat. Long story short is that at the beginning of the year, our buyers pulled out when we were like so ready to move like it was contracts were about to be signed and thank god they weren't so our buyers pulled out we went back on the market for a bit but it just like was not happening the market was very slow prices were going down and it was just not <laughs> financially feasible anymore for us to move so we took our flat off the market and we pulled out of the house that we were going to buy but before all of that dan and i had to sit down and have the conversation together to be like okay can we stay in this flat for a few more years. Can we make this flat work for us without putting our life plans on hold? Because we would like to have another kid. And initially we were like, oh, we're obviously gonna need a bigger house if we're gonna have you know, another baby. But then we just like sat down and thought about it, figured out how we can change the flat around to make it work for our current lifestyle and family setup. And we realized that we could make it work we realized that it was possible and that's when we started to make plans for Rowan's room. So yeah, we are staying. The flat kind of feels new because Rowan has his whole room and that has changed like the function of the flat and so it feels like a new flat. So our fixed rate mortgage that we are currently on at a glorious 1.49%. That comes to an end at the end of September and we're going on like a four-ish 4.1 I think percent mortgage from October onwards and we've signed a three-year fixed rate on that so we're going to be in the flat for at least another three years paying more for our mortgage because interest rates but this isn't a unique story this is happening to like so many people right now so that's the current situation in terms of any more changes to the flat I thought no I thought we're good like everything is fine however some things have come up. And so maybe there'll be some more other changes, but very minor changes, more cosmetic, because it is a new build flat. So it's not like we can do any like major renovations. There's not like space to expand or anything. This is so boring, but like if you're into talking about home stuff, then you're in. So we currently have an integrated fridge freezer. So it's got like the cupboard doors on the front of it. However, they've become really broken and wonky and they're just too heavy and the hinges aren't like holding it on. So we've taken off the cupboard door and now we have like an exposed magnetic fridge. And I'm so excited because it's actually magnetic because you can't put magnets on a cupboard door, but you can put them on an actual fridge. We were then like looking at the space that this integrated fridge is in and the space is so much bigger if we just went for a regular standalone fridge freezer and there's all this like extra height space and so we're thinking about saving up to get a fridge <laughs> how exciting and that also means that we'll have more freezer space in the fridge freezer i don't know if any of you were around for the saga of our big like chest freezer that we bought that has been so handy with having a baby because one of the drawers in the fridge freezer is just taken up with breast milk and then our chest freezer has become like the main freezer with all of the like bulk cooking and leftovers so that we just like always have meals to eat. But if we have a bigger fridge freezer, then maybe we can get rid of the chest freezer and then that space becomes massive again. And as Rowan's getting older, I'm kind of like, do we get a toddler tower? Would love to get him like a little table and chairs to like do activities and like coloring and things on, but we just don't have the space but maybe if we do that, then we'll have the space. So isn't that exciting? I'm excited by it. Have your thoughts about living in London changed since having a child? Those thoughts haven't really had a chance to change, I don't think. I just kind of like went with it and accepted that 
we were gonna be having a family in London. Dan's job is very much in London right now. We have the flat. We have an amazing childminder for Rowan and the thought of leaving her just breaks my heart. But I do find it kind of weird to think about the fact that I'm gonna have a Londoner child, like he's gonna have a London accent. And like, I'm from Manchester, I don't really sound like it, but every so often someone will be like, are you from Manchester? I'll be like, oh my God, yes, thank you. You know, it's still there, slightly, a little, a little Northern twang, but for the most part it's gone. Dan is very much a Southerner. I've always looked at other adults that I know who were born and raised in London with like a weird kind of awe. I don't know why, it's just like, oh my God, you were like raised in London, like you are a Londoner. And there is a bit of me that's like, oh, that's gonna be Rowan, Rowan's a Londoner. But my thoughts about it haven't changed in the sense of like, oh no, it's gonna be like too expensive or, you know, there's not enough greenery or, you know, the, the city's too dangerous. I don't know, like whatever the thoughts that people have when they like live in London when they don't have children and then they move out. I'm not in that mindset. I'm very much happy to stay in London. And it's very green round near where we are. I'm very comfortable getting on the tube with him. He's gonna be a little London boy and that's great. <laughs> it's fine. Although Dan and I are always just like, Rowan, it's the grass. No, Rowan, it's the grass. And the moment that child like does a long A, I'm gonna be like, no! <laughs> oh, oh dear. How do you feel about the portrayal of parents in media? Do you have a favorite fictional parent? I'm obsessed with this question because it's not something that I like had really, really thought about before, but now I think I'm gonna pay a lot more attention to the parents that I see in the media, but there is one set of parents that immediately came to mind in terms of like iconic, amazing, just the best. I think they're in like one or two scenes of this movie, but they steal the show. And maybe some of you are like, I know, I know. And it is the parents in Easy A. Don't even know what their names are, but Stanley Tucci plays the dad. And I actually met him recently at the Women's Prize for Fiction. Amazing, amazing, oh my God, starstruck. But the parents in Easy A are incredible. Like they are heroes. They are an inspiration, I think, to all parents out there. And if I can emulate their parenting style in any way, like I will consider that an achievement. They're amazing. I need to sit down and think about more fictional parents. The only other one that comes to mind is Otis's mum in Sex Education, played by Gillian Anderson. She is great. I don't know how much of her parenting I want to emulate. Some of it, definitely. Some of it, definitely not. <laughs> but she is also iconic. Would you ever get a breast reduction after you've finished breastfeeding? Ah, I've thought about this a lot and I've thought about it only hypothetically. I've not really given it much extra thought actually since I've started breastfeeding. But it is something that like before having a baby, I always kind of said like, oh, maybe I'll get a breast reduction after like I'm finished breastfeeding. And now that that's kind of like getting closer, I'm like, oh, I don't know. On the one hand, having a breast reduction is major surgery. And there are like two ways that I think about major surgery. One is done it three times already. It's an absolute doddle. It's fine, it's easy, I've recovered from surgeries before, I can recover from another one, it's fine. And then on the other hand, I'm like, I've been there, it is fucking hard. Surgery is a big fucking deal and it should not be taken lightly and it is serious and there are risks. So <laughs> that's where my brain is at. But I don't know, I'm gonna see how I feel after I'm like done, done breastfeeding but having big boobs is just so annoying, especially when I have such a petite frame. It's just a nightmare in terms of clothes, bras, and money connected to all of that stuff. But then also just like my back and my shoulders, and then also just like general self-esteem and the way that I look at myself and body image and things like that. But I don't have to make a decision right now, do I? It's fine, it's fine. How do you deal with weirdos on the internet who objectify you, specifically on that subreddit? Okay, I'm gonna do a thing that I said I would never do, which is a dress that I know about the subreddit. I know about the subreddit. It's not hard to know about it, but basically, there is a Hannah Witten subreddit, I have absolutely nothing to do with it, and it's just a bunch of guys scouring the internet for every photo of me, every like screenshot from a video of me where I maybe am scantily dressed, maybe there's a bit of cleavage, maybe there's a bit of leg, like whatever it is, and it's just them being like, fwa tits, and 
I hate it. I don't go there because it makes me feel like shit and I've never like addressed that it is a thing that exists because I never wanted to draw attention to it before. But I've decided fuck that, I'm gonna draw attention to it and I know that there are a lot of normal people who are part of my audience who use Reddit. So go at it. Reddit is a public forum. Like if you want to use the Hannah Witten subreddit to talk about my videos instead of perving on my assets, then like you can do that. And maybe it will become a nicer place overall. But also like you don't feel like you have to do that. We can just leave them to it, but I hate it and I never go there. But how do I deal with it? I don't know, mostly by ignoring and blocking, but I don't have a Reddit account and I don't go on Reddit. But if they're gonna be perving on me in places like my YouTube comments or my Instagram DMs or comments, then that's just like an easy like block report blur. Unfortunately, it is like one of those things that is a side effect of being a woman on the internet. And I hate that it's something that is so normal that we come to just expect it. And kind of like what I've been doing the last few years since I found out about that subreddit, just like not saying anything. I think I always wanted to like not like touch it because I didn't want them to know that I knew. <laughs> But hey, the cat's out the bag now. I very much know about the subreddit and I hate it. How to decide if you should have kids. I thought this was an interesting question because actually this is a conversation that I've been having with a lot of friends recently. Friends who've just like brought it up in conversation who've gone like, do I wanna have kids? How do I decide if I should have kids? Like, is that something that I want? What things should I be thinking about? Like, how do I even make that decision? And I find it really interesting because for me, there was no question. I always knew that I wanted to have kids and then I was lucky enough to be able to have a kid. There was never a decision about if, it was always a decision about when. And then that decision was kind of made for me because of my health stuff and I kind of needed to like speed up the having kids thing so that I could hopefully have some room to deal with health stuff after. But I also kind of like that that decision was taken away from me a little bit. It was like, all right, we've got to get going. Let's have kids now. But then that decision was taken away from me because fertility stuff and it took us a year. Anyway, anyway, let's get to the question about if you're on the fence and you don't know. I obviously cannot answer this question for you. It is a question for you and whoever you may or may not be having children with to answer together. But just know that having a child means you have to sacrifice a lot of things and you have to be so ready for that. There are a lot of other parts of my life that have had to take a back seat and I don't know if or when I'll be able to like access those things again, but also everything is just a phase and temporary, but you do truly have to be prepared for your whole lifestyle to change. Also, if you are going to be having a child with somebody else, then you have to be having such brutally honest conversations about your relationship dynamic, about parenting, about domestic labor, about like the mental load and how those things are divvied up in your relationship. I know far too many people who weren't having these conversations before they had kids and then it just all comes to a boiling point after having kids and it just makes parenting so, so much harder if you're going into it without a game plan with your co-parent. And then maybe a question to ask yourself is in 10, 15 years time, if I don't have a kid, will I regret it? But then also in 10, 15 years time, if I do have a kid, will I regret it? That's maybe like a weirder question to pose yourself because most people who have kids don't regret it. But then also there's like a big taboo of having any kind of regret. Like you're not allowed to regret it at all because your children are supposed to be like, the best thing that's ever happened to you. And usually that is the case, even with people who do have unintended pregnancies, they will often say, don't regret it at all, like the best thing that's ever happened to me, but it is okay. Like it is totally valid to like mourn your previous life because it will change. Try and put yourself in the position of you like 10 years in the future and what does that life look like for you. I hope that helps. But if you are on the fence or if you were on the fence and you have since made a decision either way, please feel free to share in the comments if you want to what 
skewed you either way? What were the things that you thought about? What were the questions you asked yourself? And what was it ultimately that helped you make that decision? I'd be curious to know. Has Rowan shown any interest in your stoma? This is such a cool question because yes, kind of, but also just like not at all. So often I do have to like change my stoma bag in the mornings and Rowan is just around. And in that case, he kind of just ignores me. Usually Dan is around then as well because it's very useful to have somebody else who can deal with him if something happens because, you know, if I've just got my ileostomy just like out without a bag on or anything, then I'm not gonna be the most useful parent. But during bag changes, he never really seems to take an interest. However, sometimes when I'm on the toilet and I'm emptying my bag, he'll come like crawling into the toilet and he's like crawling towards me. And I'm like, get my legs out being like, don't come any closer. <laughs> But I try and like explain to him what's happening. I'm like, mummy is going to the toilet. Mummy's having a poo. This is how mummy poos. It's different to how you and daddy poo. Also, he started saying the word poo and it's so cute. This morning I changed his nappy and he was like, poo, poo, poo. Ah, adorable. But also because I sleep in the same bed with him most nights and I tend to sleep naked, but I do have a stoma bag cover on because otherwise the bag like gets scratchy and itchy on my skin. And sometimes he sees it there and will like, bang it or like pull on the bag and I'm like, no. But he just kind of like sees it as another like piece of clothing. I mean, he just like, you know, grabs my boobs and like slaps my boobs. So it's all just kind of like part of the same thing. But I do have to kind of be like, no, you can't touch that, please. But yeah, so in some ways he's shown an interest in other ways not, but I just think that the best thing is to not hide it from him and just like, you know, do my normal thing that I would do. And then like when he does start to show an interest, like explain stuff as he asks, but also just like narrate what's happening and stuff as well. But yeah, who knows, who knows what he'll think of it. <laughs> when was the last time you got drunk? I thought this was an interesting question because like so much of my online brand several years ago was me being drunk on the internet. And that is just not the case anymore. I don't not drink, but I barely drink. When I do drink, I tend just to have one drink, so I'm not really getting drunk anymore. However, there was a time in the last few months where I did get drunk and it actually ended up being a really bad idea. And so I'm not planning on getting drunk again in the future, but I will still like have the odd drink here and there. But basically we were at Dan's uncle's wedding and there was a travel cot in the room and I thought, great, we'll put Rowan to sleep in the travel cot, which means we won't be bed sharing, which means that I can have a few drinks because you shouldn't share your bed with your baby if you're drunk. That is like, no, 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 don't do that. That doesn't make it very safe. So I had a few drinks. I was a bit drunk and then trying to get Rowan to sleep in that travel cart, not happening, not happening. He was not having it. And like fair enough to him because he's not slept in a cot for months. And like, I don't know why we thought all of a sudden we would be able to get him down in a cot when we had had him in the bed with us for months. So that was stupid. <laughs> but essentially Dan was drunk and I was drunk. Not so, so drunk that it was like dangerous to be looking after a child, but I definitely didn't feel comfortable like sleeping next to him in the bed. So what we did was it was like one of those big like hotel beds where it's like quite a big mattress and then like the big boxy bed frame. So what we did is we pulled the mattress onto the floor and we got Rowan to sleep on the mattress by himself. And then Dan and I slept on the bed frame box. It was very hard surface, but we did manage to get some sleep and the image was actually quite funny. I took a very <laughs> silly photo of like Dan asleep on the bed frame box. And then this is like massive mattress on the floor with just this tiny baby asleep on it. It was ridiculous, but it was fine. Never again. If I do have one drink, I either make sure it's in the middle of the day, like we're having a pub lunch or something. But if it is in the evening, I make sure that drink is like my first drink of the evening and then nothing else. Well, water obviously for the rest of the night so that by the time I go to bed with Rowan, I am sober. But yeah, that was the last time I got drunk and that was a few months ago and it was very silly. Do you think about quitting YouTube slash what's your backup plan if YouTube fails? Yes, I do think about quitting YouTube. About every quarter I have a panic and that has been the case for probably the last five to seven years. And Dan will vouch for me in that. Just every few months I'm just like, 
can't handle it anymore. I'm gonna quit. But then I have the like, fuck, what would I do if I did quit? And I have never been able to answer that question before until recently. I've finally actually figured out what I would do hypothetically if I were to leave YouTube or whatever. I have no plans to do that currently. I'm very much sticking around, but it feels really good to like know what the backup is. I think previously a lot of my anxiety around YouTube and being like an online content creator came from the feeling of being trapped. Like I felt like this was the only thing that I could do. And yes, there are a lot of amazing things that I really love about it. But then when the things that I find really difficult about it, like, you know, get really difficult or they come to the forefront every now and then, and I just feel like I can't handle it. I then like don't know what my alternative would be. And that really stresses me out. But now that I like have an idea about what I would enjoy doing that isn't this, it like, I don't know, it just like makes me feel a lot more free and relaxed and I can enjoy this a lot more because then also I have something to compare it to because I don't want to leave anytime soon because I'm like, oh, I found this other thing that I think I would also enjoy doing. But actually for now, this, what I'm doing now is better, but it does feel really freeing in that I have this other option. If suddenly that seems more appealing, then I can look at that and explore it more and see if there's any changes that I can make here as well. But weirdly enough, figuring out what my alternative is has actually made me like happier to stay here. Does that make any sense? I think it's because before I didn't feel like I had any other options. And so there's kind of like a bit of a fearful resentment to staying. Whereas now it actually feels like an active choice and like a joyful choice, if that makes any sense. So on that note, thanks for watching my YouTube videos. And thank you for watching this one. I hope you enjoyed this little casual Q and a. Don't forget as well that all of the videos and the content that I do make is made possible by my patrons over at the common room. And if you want to join and help support me and my team, do what we do and make what we make and have a really fun time doing it and be part of the community, then please do go and check out the Patreon. Link will be in the description. And also I'm currently running an offer on annual memberships. So you can sign up monthly, but if you sign up for the annual membership, then you get a discount. And that discount is currently 16%. That is the highest that Patreon will let you set it at. And that discount is going to be running until the 15th of July. So a week and a half's time. But yeah, I just thought I'd let you know in case you you are considering joining, now would be a good time because you get that cheeky cheeky discount. I hope that you're all doing well and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.